Welcome to Securing America with me, Frank Gaffney, the program that's a kind of owner's manual on protecting the country we love against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to the glory of God and his kingdom. We're going to have a fascinating conversation for this next hour with a man I have the privilege of working with at our Center for Security Policy, where he is the senior analyst for Russian and European affairs. His name is Andrei Ilarionov. He has, however, a very remarkable background. And we're going to start the program by talking a bit about how that came to be and lessons taken from it. He was for about six years the economic advisor to the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, a man who he was reluctant to work for and ultimately resigned in protest over some of his conduct. And uh, in the course of their time together, he had an opportunity, of course, to get to know the man and to understand what makes him tick. And I'm anxious to begin this hour-long conversation with Andre by drilling down on a man who has become quite notorious in recent months, specifically the past year, for his invasion of Ukraine and the manner in which he has conducted it. And as important are his insights into what may be next if Vladimir Putin has his way. Andrei Ilarionov, it is a delight to have you with us. Thank you for giving us a full hour of your time. It's a pleasure to have you have that length of time to drill down in detail in some of these topics. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Frank, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Let me start by just asking you to um, explain in Brief form, if you would, how it is you came to be uh, Vladimir Putin's economic advisor for six years. I'm an economist by training, and in the late 1999 and early year 2000, when uh, there was a transition from Boris Yeltsin, former Russian president, to a new one, this a new one person who has been pre selected by a group of people around. Uh, Yeltsin, uh, Mr. Putin, was looking around for members of his team, team uh, uh, in different areas, and certainly in economic team, since he did not know much about economics and he was interested in uh, finding people who could help him in economics. After looking for a number of people, finally he uh, uh, was uh suggested to see me we met and after more than three hours uh, conversation he invited me to be his uh, economic advisor so to make this story short uh i certainly i refused but uh, after several attempts i finally agreed just uh, having in mind idea that uh, russia by that time was for nine years in economic crisis in deep economic depression so that is why i was thinking about whether i can do something to help country to come out of this long and deep longest and deepest re recession and depression in the history of the country so i joined in april year 2000 and uh, i was uh, economic advisor to the russian president for as you correctly mentioned about six years and it goes without saying that um, it must have weighed on you at some point that it was probably advisable not to continue to refuse, <laughs> in addition to the possibility of maybe making a difference um, in the direction of your country, um, that Putin was a guy not to be crossed, I assume was a factor, was it? Russia was a different, very different country uh, 23 years ago. So that is why, uh, for me, it was not a problem to say to him no, and I did it twice, and I said yes on the, for the third time, and uh, that was not a problem because country was much freer uh, than uh, rather than today. Uh, 
So that is why the, the most important uh, idea for me was whether it's possible to just to uh, to to end this endless and deepest and one of the most devastating uh, depressions in the history of the country. And in fact, uh, I gather, thanks in no small measure to your counsel, um, he was able for a time to lift Russia out of that very difficult state and to get it onto a footing that was considerably more promising economically. Is that right? Yes. Uh, fortunately, uh, with the help of a number of other people and with the uh, work of the government, with the other team, we were able to organize, econ first of all, the end of the recession, the beginning of economic growth, and the economic growth reached a very impressive 7% per year for 10 years. So that is why for 10 years, Russia had uh, historically the highest uh, economic growth rate, which allowed a country to double GDP, to double GDP per capita in real terms, and increase private consumption per capita by 2.3 times. Once again, within 10 years. So by economic standards, it's considered to be economic miracle. So anyway, so it was uh, fulfillment of my uh, idea, my dream to end this uh, recession. We happened to do it. And actually, it was improvement in living standards uh, of the Russian population, the best in the history of the country. Yeah. A remarkable story. Um, Andre, we could talk more about this uh, interminably, I suppose, to draw out sort of lessons learned about the man. But I guess maybe just to wrap up this particular part of the story, how is it that you came to part ways with Vladimir Putin and when? Uh, as you once again correctly mentioned, it was not uh, my uh, best desire uh, and my dream uh, just to go to work uh, for the person who was a former KGB officer. Uh, it was not something that I uh, dreamed of uh, all my life. Um, nevertheless, that was the, uh, you know, the story that happened. So. Um, to help uh, with economic advices and to help with economic policy to start economic growth, to sustain high economic growth, it's a one story. But to be with a government that is persecuting own population, persecuting persecuting opposition, just and once and even just started uh, to kill people whom uh, Putin himself or some other people did not like. It is not something that I would uh, agree with, and I would stay with this government. So that is why I made uh, a warning uh, to my uh, former boss once, twice, and for the third time, I departed from the government. Hmm. Uh, the Beslan theater incident, as I understand it, was kind of the, the point of uh, the rupture between you. Is that right? A uh, number of cases. Uh, one of that just I could not tolerate at all. Uh, the killing of more than 300 people in Beslan during the siege of this school in North Ossetia. Uh, Let me ask you to hold the thought, if you would, Andre. We have to take a very short break. We'll be right back with Andre Elarinov. He'll complete his story about how he parted ways with Vladimir Putin right after this. Back, we're speaking with Andrei Ilarionov. These days, a man I've got the privilege of calling a colleague as our senior analyst for Russian and European affairs at the Center for Security Policy. But we're talking about this remarkable background that had him working in the Kremlin for Vladimir Putin for some six years. And uh, before the break, I was obliged to truncate your answer to my question about how it was that you finally called an end to your time with Putin and, and this uh, incident where uh, there was horrific murder 
of Innocence in a theater in Beslan in Russia um, was a was a breaking point. And just complete that story, if you would. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I may, just I prefer to say that I was working not for Mr. Putin, I was working for Russia. So because my idea was not to please him, but I my idea was to help Russian people to come out of poverty and out of the deepest and uh, longest economic crisis. As for uh, problems, uh, as a problem, uh, as uh, my uh, as for my uh, work with uh, Mr. Putin, there were a number of cases that make me uh, sick. Uh, one of them is the siege uh, of the heat in Moscow in year 2002, North Ost, uh, during which uh, Russian troops used a gas to uh, kill people, and they uh, killed more than 130 people in Moscow. Two years later, in year 2004, uh, Russian troops and special forces stormed uh, the school in Beslan in North Ossetia and they use uh, flamethrowers to kill people, more than 300 people, kids, their parents and their teachers, after which I told uh, Mr. Putin, whom uh, I was advising on economic issues and was the Sherpa, uh, meaning the assistant at G7, G8 uh, international club, I told him that I cannot work for the person who is giving orders to kill own people. And I departed uh, from this position. And one year later, when uh, Mr. Putin with his uh, colleague Mr. Medvedev, also uh, known uh, around the world, organized a stealing of 12 billion US dollars from the Russian state coffers in the so-called IPO of Rosneft, I told him and everybody that I cannot work with the government and with the people who are stealing from the own people. So in December year 2005, I resigned from this position saying that I cannot work for the people, for the government that becoming authoritarian, totalitarian, and is killing our own people and stealing from own people. Yeah. The transformation of Russia uh, as you say, during that period was uh, was rather dramatic and has only become more so, of course, as Putin became even more tyrannical. Let me ask you, because this really informs the topic that we're particularly anxious to discuss with you, and that is Vladimir Putin's attitude towards not only his role and Russia's place in the world, but the imperative that he apparently feels to correct what he has, I think, repeatedly described as the greatest catastrophe in the 20th century, namely the fall of the Soviet Union, the end of its, what well, my old boss Ronald Reagan called evil empire. Um, Discuss his attitudes on these questions, uh, Andre, as it informs the conversation I want to have with you next about Ukraine, how that has come to pass. Right. Uh, from the very beginning, he uh, expressed uh, this uh, feeling, uh, sad feeling about the collapse of the uh, Russian, of the Soviet Union, which is considered to be around the world uh, the empire which is uh, essentially is correct. So um, uh, this is one story, but uh, I think it would be appropriate to say that in his thinking, he was trying to restore not the Soviet Union itself, at least as I understand it, but part of the Soviet Union so that from his point of view would be much more solid, uh, with, uh, would be much more efficient and would not be prone to collapse at the uh, former Soviet Union. And this new uh, state formation would include Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, maybe Georgia, uh, but it would be not the whole former Soviet Union as a, as a new entity. More of a kind of Russian empire. It would be like a Slavic uh, Orthodox uh, empire would be something mm. like that. Yeah, and and Ukraine would be very much a fixture in that uh, resuscitated empire. 
And the question that that begs is, did he therefore have for quite some time, without regard for what was going on with NATO, uh, this aspiration of taking not just pieces of Ukraine, but the entirety of it to affix to his project? Uh, in his terminology, it is conf it, it is uh, being called as historic Russia. So that is why he did not give rightful existence neither for Ukraine, nor for Belarus, nor for Moldova. He uh, considers all these territories, including Russia itself, as historic Russia. And that is why this term is being used regularly uh, by him. Uh, as for NATO, it um, seems to me that he does not have uh, a very special animosity to NATO. Back uh, in his first years, year 2000, year 2001, and year 2002, he did not express any negative reaction towards uh, NATO. Moreover, he was advocating actively for Russia to be joining NATO in the first three years of uh, his term. So he's um, considering NATO as the problem, as the obstacle for his project of historic Russia. If NATO would be neutral or would be uh, reluctant to participate in any actions against that, he probably would be fine with NATO. The problem with NATO is that NATO is not only the uh, group of countries, not only the military alliance that is uh, having this goal to keep security for themselves, but also for the whole North European sphere, which means the preservation of internationally recognized inter, uh, international border. And that, that's not, that is not much liked by Mr. Putin. Hmm. So when you talk about this period during which he was favorably disposed towards NATO, uh, that clearly underwent a change, I believe in 2007, he began to become uh, very preoccupied with denouncing NATO and um, opposing its further expansion. Am I right about that? And, and what precipitated that change, do you think? Certainly, there is a big debate about the date, about uh, the date of the term in uh, Putin, Putin's attitudes toward the um, international peace and security and the relations with NATO, all the West uh, as a whole. Uh, from my point of view, the crucial point uh, happened in year 2003, and uh, that was the result of a number of events, and first of all, probably of the uh, uh, war uh, against, in, against Iraq in year 2003. And that played a very important role in his uh, changing attitudes. Uh, in year 2003, he launched attack against his mm, opposition in Russia itself, like Yukos and Kandarkovsky and all other people. And uh, from year 2003, we can de uh, detect his very different attitudes toward the West and very different attitudes towards Ukraine. We're going to talk about most, both of those at greater length in a moment. We're just going to have to take a very short break. We'll be right back with Andrei Ilarionov, our expert at the Center for Security Policy on Russian Affairs and more, right after this. Welcome back. And Andrei Ilarionov is giving us an hour of his time to talk about a man that is at the center of one of the great crises of the moment, that is the invasion of Ukraine he precipitated uh, back in February of 2022. Andrei had close experience with an, the man involved, Vladimir Putin, and we've been beginning to assess how his experiences and insights can inform our understanding what Putin is up to. And you, you mentioned uh, the war in Iraq changing 
his attitude uh, in an important respect. I, I did just want to tease this out with you, though. Um, if he believed, going back to his first days in office, that it was a great catastrophe for the Soviet Union to have fallen, wouldn't he have always considered the blame to lie with member nations of NATO, including, of course, the, our own, the United States, which I believe Ronald Reagan had a pivotal role in helping bring about the uh, the demise of the evil empire. But uh, could you just walk through that quickly with us, Andre? Uh, first of all, I think that future historians or psychologists or psychiatrists that would be able to solve this puzzle, what exactly happened in the mind of Mr. Putin and what actually forced him to change radically his views would get a Nobel Prize at some point. So that is why I'm not uh, you know, planning to do it or claiming that I'm ready to do it. But my feeling is that he was using this Iraq war of year 2003 as an opportunity to start to execute the program that he had in his mind, but he was cautious and shy to do it before something had happened on the international arena. And so he looked at this uh, war as uh, some kind of the green light that if it is possible to do, let's say, for the United States and for the president of the United States, it means that something else is allowed to do for himself within Russia, and after that, in what he considers uh, and considered to be a so-called Russian sphere of influence. And so we began seeing him in a series of assaults on former nations of uh, the old Soviet Union, uh, now independent states, um, seizing territory or chunks of it at least, threatening uh, larger chunks at that. Um, and, and I guess just to get to the present pass, he clearly signaled in uh, late 2021 and the beginning of 2022 a desire to move against parts of Ukraine that he had not already um, been active in uh, Crimea and, uh, and the eastern uh, regions, Donbass, and so on, but um, perhaps to invade the entire country. And uh, you were among those who was concerned that this was a real prospect uh, at a time when a lot of other people were dismissing it. Uh, give us your sense of why Putin thought that moment was opportune to take a step that he had clearly had in mind for some time. Uh, Putin is very attentive to the international situation as we have discussed already. And so the most important factor in the whole uh, dynamics of international politics is the person who is occupying the White House in the city of Washington. This is a crucial uh, factor. And that is why Putin was uh, accurately calibrating his actions uh, based on what kind of reaction might be from the United States. And uh, we can see that uh, during the four years of the predecessor of the previous president, the President Trump, Mr. Putin was very, very shy. He did not attack any country. He did not launch uh, any operation. All that he did, and especially the most active one, was in year 2014 against Crimea. It's under President's, uh, presidency of Mr. Obama and vice presidency of Mr. Biden. Next year, year 2015, he intervened in Syria with actually with the permission, even I would say invitation of Mr. Obama. So for the next four years, from year 2017 to year 2020, during the presidency of Mr. Trump, Mr. Uh, Putin did nothing in terms of aggressions and interventions against other countries. But since arrival uh, into the White House of the new president, the former vice president, Mr. Biden, uh, Putin uh, found uh, that uh, 
time extremely favorable for his new aggression campaign. And that is why right away, immediately, he uh, renewed construction of uh, Nord Stream gas pipeline to uh, Europe, which actually have been has been sanctioned by the U.S. Congress, but all of those sanctions have been canceled by the uh, Biden administration. After that, he put troops to the Ukrainian border in March, April 21. After that, in September 21, and after that, in the late 21, early 22, he moved the largest groups of uh, Russian troops. Uh, to attack Ukraine as a whole. So he found the, uh, this uh, term of the, uh, this current uh, US president at the most favorable time for doing his international aggressions. One other factor that was contributing presumably to this calculation was that he had already begun to affect a, uh, well, an alignment, one might say. Um, another way it's been characterized is a kind of um, partnership, uh, no limits partnership, indeed, with China. That meant he had not only little resistance, if any, from the United States as the leader of the West, but he also had an ally who would be able to um, help him contend with whatever repercussions might arise. And therefore, when the two met in February of 2022 on the margins of the Beijing Olympics, um, it seems that the Chinese greenlighted this invasion. So I assume that that was a calculation as well in his thinking. We still don't know exactly what happened uh, during that meeting, but uh, the understanding that Moreover, we more or less we have uh, about this meeting that uh, Putin definitely hinted that he is going to do something in Ukraine with Ukraine. What exactly still not clearly enough, but it was clearly that he mentioned that there will be some problem, and he promised to see that he would solve all these problems in a relatively short period of time, which happened to be not true, as we all know. So uh, for he seems to me the very fast so-called uh, operation of Russian troops in Ukraine was reasonable and possible, and he would definitely would have no problem with that. But the long uh, continuing war of attrition that is right now is not something uh, that he likes very much. So that is why he had uh, even publicly some reprimands to uh, Putin for not be for the fact that he he Putin was not able to finish to put it, uh, in such a way uh, this problem so fast as he promised. Now, Andre, you have recently completed a trip to Ukraine where you've had a chance to inspect what's actually happening on the ground there. And I think it's fair to say that whatever the public uh, expression of uh, displeasure that has been made by Xi Jinping, um, the reality is he is actually enabling the war to continue and to make it possible for Putin to engage in the kind of uh, war of attrition, the mass destruction, the incredible carnage that uh, he's doing in a, in a nation that, by the way, Xi Jinping had uh, allied with at one point, uh, I think it's fair to say. So this, uh, talk about double games, uh, <laughs> this uh, game that the uh, Chinese are playing seems not to be materially uh, causing the Russians to reconsider what they're doing. To the contrary, it's making it possible, is it not? Uh, yes, I think it's a very dangerous uh, turn of events. And I would say evolution, if the word evolution is being, is, can be applied to this particular event, a particular chain of events. Uh, it looks like that a C is very serious, seriously thinking about the uh, operation against Taiwan, 
and it means the war with the United States. And he learned uh, a lot of lessons from the Putin's uh, war against Ukraine. And he found that this war is of industrial type. This is a long war. This is a big war. And that is why he see, needs much more weapons and resources and material to successfully, from his point of view, to wage this war. So that is why he needs much more resources that probably he has under his command. And that is why, in order to get those resources, he needs to develop relations with Putin, first of all, to get as much as possible of his resources to prepare well for intervention against Taiwan and against war. Which, and uh, to have in turn uh, Putin's support for that operation. Uh, we're going to have to take a very short break. We'll be right back with more with Andrei Elarianov right after this. Welcome back. We're having a fascinating conversation with a man who actually worked with Vladimir Putin very closely for six years in the Kremlin, has followed him closely before and since, and has some insights into what he's up to uh, more broadly. And this draws me to ask you about a couple of things, Andre. One is uh, this relationship with Xi is a factor, obviously, in both men's thinking about their ambitions. Uh, we're talking to you really in the context of how the United States and the free world can contend with these dictators, living with dictators, if you will. Um, but specifically, a couple of points. Um, do you believe that and does what you saw in Ukraine confirm that Putin believed he was being greenlighted to invade Ukraine uh, by the Biden administration? Uh, the first point, I, I think it's a very important one. I don't think that uh, the relation between C and Putin at this moment can be characterized by the term military alliance. I think we are not yet there, but uh, what is very clearly, especially from the recent visit of C to Moscow and meeting with Putin, it is developing in this direction. And if this war of Putin against Ukraine continues at this pace as it is right now, and with preparation of the war by sea against Taiwan, these relations might be developing in a real military alliance. And that is why United States will see not only China in front of them, but China with Russia. And this is an absolutely new uh, geopolitical situation. As for the war uh, that Putin uh, uh, wages um, against Ukraine, it is absolutely clear that uh, Putin considered the no, uh, absence of any serious response from the White House uh, in the late 21 and early 22. But moreover, uh, the actions of Biden administrations towards Putin and towards Ukraine had a clear invitation to do something. We remember the words of uh, Biden himself, my incursion is not an aggression. Uh, we remember that Biden recalled all uh, American instructors from the Ukrainian territories, all uh, American citizens, American Navy from the Black Sea, even the U.S. Embassy from Kiev to Lviv and after that to Poland. And all this, uh, Biden was saying, okay, U.S. is not going to participate, military would not participate. So how Putin should consider all these words and all these actions? Only one, as an invitation to Ukraine. And he did it exactly what uh, Mr. Biden suggested to him to do it. Um, this brings me to where we are in that war now a year on. Andre, um, as I say, you've 
just had an opportunity to see firsthand what's happening on the ground there. How would you characterize um, both the state of the Russian ability to continue to prosecute this war and the ability of the Ukrainians uh, to continue to thwart the you know, achievement of Putin's goal of conquering the entirety of the place? Ukrainians are absolutely determined not to give up and to continue the war until the victory uh, they uh, consider to liberation of all occupied territories. Here the problem because uh, they understand Ukrainians, they did not understand even one year ago, slightly more than a year ago, many people would say, oh, come on, uh, whether Crimea or Donbass, okay, let them probably to stay under uh, Putin's occupation. Now they understand if any part of the Ukrainian territory stays under Putin's occupation, it means continuation of this war. And the new attack of Putin, one month later, two months, one year ago, uh, later, two years later, it is now absolutely clear. And that is why they understand, regardless how difficult, how bloody, how serious this war, this war should be finished now, because otherwise, those wars will be continued by Putin. So that is why Ukrainians are determined uh, to continue until the victory. The problem is that due to disparity uh, in military potential between Ukraine and Russia, by different indicators could be 10 to 1 or 15 to 1, I mean just uh, in favor of Russia. Russia is much larger, is much better military prepared. Ukraine alone cannot withstand this pressure and that is why it's so much crucial support that ukrainian partners including the united states united states american people can provide ukraine in withstanding this pressure from uh putin you've mentioned several times uh, that the ukrainians are determined to secure a victory um from your visits with them including in very recent weeks um, what does that victory look like? And uh, I want you also, this may slop over into the next block, um, to talk about whether anything short of victory is not simply likely to conduce to more warfare in Ukraine, but perhaps by Putin elsewhere as well. All right. For them, uh, victory is very clear. Uh, first of all, it's the liberation of all occupied territories, the first one. Certainly they would so like that's... to... Crimea and including, the Donbass areas, yes. as well as anything else that he's taken more recently. According to the United Nations Charter of the uh, Preservation of International Recognized International Borders, that's, uh, that's a law that has been never violated since 1945. So in all those cases like uh, Iraq invasion of Kuwait uh, has been repelled with the help of the United States, with a crucial help. And the United States was a leading force around the world in preservation of international recognized borders and mutually agreed by neighbors. So that is why it uh, goes strictly according to the international law, uh, which is supported by the United States and the partners. It is strictly goes uh, uh, along uh, with the line uh, to uh, save uh, all people who are now uh, on the occupied territories. Hold that thought. We'll be right back with more with Andrei Elyonov right after this. Andrei Elyonov is in the house with us for this full hour. We're concluding with this segment. And Andre, there's so much more to talk about. I know we'll run out of time before we get all of this covered, but I did want you just to finish that thought. Um, in addition to the Ukrainians believing they must achieve a victory that involves the complete withdrawal of Russian forces from Ukraine, your thoughts about Putin's sense of victory, uh, would he be satisfied with a ceasefire? that has him basically holding what he currently has of Ukraine? Or do you anticipate that he would insist eventually, if not immediately, on taking the rest of Ukraine? And, and would even that satisfy him, knowing him as you do? 
At this moment, I think he would be extremely satisfied with the ceasefire because that ceasefire would give him a, a chance to accumulate more forces, to prepare a better army and to invade uh, the rest of Ukraine again. We don't know when, but he definitely wants to destroy Ukraine. Actually, he never um, uh, changed his officially proclaimed forces of demilitarization of Ukraine and so-called denazification of Ukraine, which means uh, destruction of all Ukrainian identity. So he never changed his mind, he never changed his decision, so he continues to do exactly what he has proclaimed on night of February 24th, 2022. Uh, and would he be satisfied with the, you know, takeover of all of Ukraine? Or do you anticipate that that would simply whet his appetite for further aggression elsewhere? Definitely not. That's only first step. And he never, once again, never hided his plans. He's planning to restore the so-called historic Russia, which, as we have uh, talked a little bit, includes Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, and Baltic republics. In his mind, uh, historic Russia is a territory uh, of the Russian Empire at the end of 18th century. He openly wrote about this article back in 2012. So this is the first step. Actually, this will be the second step. But third step, as he proclaimed in uh, December 2021, to move NATO back to so-called 1997 division line in Europe which means all countries that happen to be members of NATO after 1997 must go through the so-called denatoization. So that is why it's once again, it's only beginning. He would never stop until he will be stopped. Yes. This brings me to a last point, uh, Andre. And um, as you know very well, uh, there is a growing concern among many of us, that the United States is likely to face, for reasons we've discussed, um, aggression, not just perhaps from Russia, but from China as well, in the Pacific. And that may be specifically focused at Taiwan. It may be broader, especially if the Russians and Chinese are both engaged. The concern has grown over the year since Putin invaded Ukraine, that we don't have the wherewithal to continue to supply armaments to Ukraine to fight this war, uh, lest we find ourselves even more disadvantaged in contending with a Chinese or Chinese and Russian threat in the Pacific, possibly even against us directly. How do you respond to both the need to continue to support Ukraine on the one hand and to do so in a way that enables us somehow simultaneously to manage to contend with this threat in the Pacific? Uh, there are a number of things that might be done uh, by the United States. First of all, I think uh, it, everybody should be absolutely serious about the security challenges that the United States and the whole free world uh, are facing today in view of such uh, um, aggressive uh, uh, dictatorships like China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. And nobody should be blind and deaf about that. So it is necessary to overhaul uh, the whole military program, military expenditure, and it might be increased substantially just to face uh, the real threat, the real risk of much larger and much more serious war, even compared to what we have right now. That's number one. And, thank, and frankly speaking, that the thanks to this uh, resistance that Ukraine is showing, because it has shown that industrial type warfare is the something that we are facing today, not 50 years ago or not 80 years ago. This war is industrial warfare that consumes much more material, much more resources, much more munition than um, anybody would think one year ago. That's number one. 
Second, uh, Ukrainian army today is a probably one of the strongest, if not the strongest army on the European continent. This is a unique invention. It's just nobody thought about this uh, slightly more than one year ago, but events have shown that it's fact of life compared to other uh, nations. Ukraine has probably the most effective, the most uh, the strongest, the most powerful military force on the continent. And Ukraine might play, and it's actually it's playing, it's contributing to security of the European continent and security of the whole world, including the United States, by the way how they address this uh, Russian aggression. So that is why we could think, and actually the United States could think about the, might, uh, the new type of arrangement and new type of approach to secure peace and uh, international relations new world so that is why it's probably time to make some changes uh, both in military production in military expenditures in the position and posture of the u.s forces and forces of the uh, partners and allies of the united states it's a, it's probably time for overhaul of number of important elements of the strategy and the practical implementation of the strategy today we're going <clears throat> excuse me we're going to have to have you back to discuss all of those recommendations andre alaranov we can benefit greatly from your insights as an economist as well as a now close observer of what is happening in ukraine we have long argued that we need to be on a war footing in this country certainly in the face of what we're facing from china but also this wider war that is upon us Thank you for your expertise on all of these matters, Andre. Thank you for what you're doing for us at the Center for Security Policy. Let's revisit all of it again in the very near future. I hope the rest of you will join us again for the next edition of Securing America, and that in the meantime, you will go forth and multiply.